Here's an idea. Writing for comics is maybe remarkably like DMing a Dungeons and Dragons game. When I was but knee high to an ant, man, I was a huge, though small, fan of X-Men comics and tabletop RPGs, or at the very least their core rule books, not a whole lot of actual playing going on. As a teenager, I got distracted by computers, music, theater, and it wasn't until about a year ago that I started reading comics again. I've been tearing through the X-Men back catalog. Right now I'm reading through Rick Remender's Uncanny X-Force, and it is so good. I also started playing tabletop games again, and recently, a thing dawned on me. Maybe it's the parody of my experiences with games and comics, but I've started to notice similarities between the two. Specifically, I started thinking about how established characters in ongoing comics series have a relationship to their writers which might resemble the relationship between tabletop RPG players and their game masters. And so I started to wonder if focusing on this perspective could change my narrative experience of comics and of RPGs, for that matter. In a tabletop RPG, as the GM, you have a certain amount of control over your players in that you put them in situations that take advantage of the skills they've given their characters. You can hope that they'll act a certain way, but it's not your call. Only when everyone is at the table will you see how it works out. Covered me in murder death. <laughs> you can't force players to progress how you want them to. Or, well, you can, but that would make you a bad GM. It's kind of like asking your significant other where they want to go to dinner and then shouting, Live Mas! and then driving to Taco Bell no matter what they say. Furthermore, you want to let players get into tense situations and you want their actions to have consequences, but you can't off a player character lightly. The elf mage Skippy McGillicuddy is someone's pride and joy. If he's gotta die, the real reason better be a good one. And if it's not, there has to be some Hail Mary dice roll or sorcerer on the other side of yonder mountain or some bit of machina out of which we might day us to put the skip back in Skippy because your real life friend Sarah has spent like seven months playing as him and she doesn't want to lose him. Not like this. Which is maybe the most important question here. When you are telling stories with characters that are not yours, what is your relationship to or responsibility towards their aliveness. Relatedly, big ongoing comics series are generally written by people who did not create the characters they're writing. Wolverine, Carol Danvers, Batman are not theirs. At least, they didn't create them. But they do have a fair amount of control by virtue of the fact that they control the universe. But still, a new writer generally doesn't make an old character completely different. Writers put Comicus Personae in new and difficult situations, but shouldn't make Psylocke, behave un -Psylocke like Or you can, but that would make you a bad comics GM. It's sort of like saying, I wanna write for Psylocke, but then you put her in a red suit, let her walk on ceilings and shoot spider webs. That's someone else. The Amazing Spider-Man. And if she's killed off, oh, there had to better be a good reason and she had better come back. I really like Psylocke, so don't mess. You can kill Cyclops as many times as you want, that's fine, fine with me. But okay, my supersonic hearing is picking up on some grumbling. How is this different from literally any kind of character writing? You have typed out half yelling because you were so incensed you accidentally hit the caps lock key halfway through your interjection. A hallmark of apt authors is characters that think for themselves which are independent and are not mirrors for their story skippers. How is writing for James Bond, Olivia Pope, Tyrion Lannister, or Alicia Florrick any different than writing for someone who has mutant powers and a colorful bodysuit? The difference, I might argue, is in the structure and continuity of comics and RPGs and the audience's relationship to those things. And just for the sake of clarity, we're defining continuity here as the unbroken, unchallenged linearity of a story arc. So unlike The Good Wife or Scandal or Breaking Bad, comics writing takes place in a vast universe where continuity is constantly being re-established, sometimes in parallel. And yes, the Doctor Who, James Bond, and even Game of Thrones universes are huge and there are constant status or context changes, but even at their most wacky, continuity remains consistently managed. As many times as the Doctor has regenerated, we all very well know that he's not going anywhere. There has never been a significant amount of time where we have all thought, well, that's it, 
Alan, see you later, Doc. And though people are constantly dying permanently in Game of Thrones, we expect it. The joke is don't have a favorite character because they will die. Just don't do it. For me, both comics and tabletop games sit somewhere between Doctor Who and Game of Thrones. Each and every death is sold, sometimes literally, as the big one, the final. The end all, be all, R.I.P. Archie. But maybe there's a clone or a time machine. Or spoiler alert, Phoenix was never actually the real Jean Grey. You know, typical soap opera stuff. Or, assuming that your GM is benevolent, upon some terrible misfortune, they can utter the most conciliatory phrase a GM can. Well, instead, why don't we just say that? And then everybody nods in agreement and thinks, yes, Skippy McGillicuddy did not deserve to buy the magical elf farm after pushing the big stone button with the skull and crossbones on it. Come on! Comics and RPGs both uniquely interact with continuity because of how they're structured. But in that interaction, I think both writers and GMs have a unique responsibility to some combination of characters, players, and audience. Characters and players have a unique authority over their universes and the stories told within them, and more so than other mediums, the powers that be have a responsibility to not impose their will. And keeping this in mind, my narrative experience of these things does change. When I look at RPG players and their adventurers as if they were long-standing comics characters like Miss Marvel or Hawkeye, I begin to appreciate the amazing stories they can embody if they're treated similarly. If I start to think of long-standing comics characters as players, I begin to realize how writers might struggle with or be surprised or rewarded by the requirements or expectations of those characters. Looking at it this way, for me, the narrative focus shifts from the outcomes of arcs, books, and omnibuses or missions, campaigns, and games to the outcomes of tensions between the universe and its subjects. Not what happens because of the person in control, but in spite of them on a much grander scale. For example, where is the authority between Paul Pope and Batman? Does Batman, as a character, change even in other books with other writers? Does Paul Pope change as an author working on not Batman? How does your real-life friend Sarah gain and lose authority not just in one game, but across all the games she plays with several GMs, both as Skippy and not as Skippy? Who totally had it coming, by the way. Just saying. What do you guys think? Are there similarities between the way RPG and comics stories are structured? And what interesting things change if you view one as the other? Let us know in the comments. And in my universe, everybody has the utmost authority to do the thing. He's in the best-selling show. Is there life on Mars? Let's see what you had to say about Mars One. So I want to frame this week's comment responses with an article that Taunt tweeted at me uh, that is about a Mars One finalist who talks about the fact that Mars One is a complete scam, that there is nothing not scammy about it, including, apparently, allegedly, everything. So if you are curious about what it's like to be involved in Mars One from the inside, there is this article you should read. To describe it as damning would be an understatement. So let's just keep that in mind. In last week's episode, I said that I might argue the moon landing was not designed as a spectacle, and this week I intend to keep that promise because a bunch of people disagreed. Um, what I would say is that when the moon landing was happening, we were not able to create the level of spectacle to the level of like image, image production and marketing that we can do now. So it is fair to say that that statement is a little bit relativistic. But if you do watch the, the broadcast from the moon landing with like Walter Cronkite, it has this tone. It's so even, it's very calm. There is nothing really spectacular about it besides the fact that it is itself a spectacular event. It was not made into this great image producing machine. Uh, I mean, I think that we report with more fervor now about like celebrities being out in public than Walter Cronkite did about the moon landing. So that is what I say, that's what I mean when I say that the moon landing was not designed as a spectacle, which I really don't think it was. I mean, yes, it was set inside of 
a massive patriotic, like almost propaganda machine with the space race and the Cold War happening. So yes, um, definitely takes on a whole new level of meaning because of that. But the thing itself, I don't know, skeptical about the spectacularity of it. Which is maybe an effect of the fact that the 24 hour news cycle didn't exist yet and image creation and distribution means were not what they are today, which is definitely something that Mars One is keeping in mind and has to design for. So I think that that is maybe the difference that needs to be made, that that even though maybe they were both intended to be spectacles, possibly, Mars One will be able to create an even bigger spectacle. Sidejoy talks about how, though Mars One might not be the thing to put people in space, their idea of using entertainment to pay for space exploration might be a useful plan for NASA, um, and wonders whether or not people feel like NASA's mission could be helped by a greater exploration into entertainment. And I, I think this is a really great question, and I would love to know what you all think about this. Chris talks about how the private enterprise model for space exploration is something that gives him the jiblies, and just on a simple sort of cost basis, seems like it's a thing that only only governments should be able to pay for. And to this, my, my inner cynic says, yes, but how long until Apple is making more money than most nations in the world and can actually pay for a space exploration program? Probably not that long. And finally, two bits of useful data. Um, yesterday, there was an episode of Toy Pizza that came out that I guest star on. Uh, if you don't know Toy Pizza, it's a show about collectibles hosted by some of my friends over at Frederator, um, Nikki, Jesse, and Cade. Uh, we go through a box of old toys that my dad sent me. Um, there've actually been a, a couple things that I've been on if you've missed them. I was on uh, the Justice Points podcast talking about the time I almost bought um, a Lamborghini on Forza 5. Um, I have been on a couple episodes of uh, the Mental Floss List show, which if you haven't seen those, those were so much fun to be involved in. Um, I was on XOXO Cooks uh, a couple months ago, so we'll put links to all of these things in the doobly -doo. And you can still send us records to put on the newly much larger record wall. Today we got some great records from Ellie, Adam, and... R -E. um, all of the information for sending us stuff is in the doobly-doo. There are some restrictions that apply, like we're gonna keep the stuff that you send us for forever, but you can send us things for the next, I think it's two weeks. Some people have been telling me on Twitter what they are going to be sending us. I am very excited, oh boy, for so many reasons. This week's episode was brought to you by the very hard work of these slobbering shoggoths. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And because we didn't do a tweet of the week last week, there will be two this week. The first comes from Sarah Vale, who points us towards a piece about men not believing women, apropos of the comments left on our recent Taylor Swift video. And the second comes from Sometimes Reads, who points us towards a brain pickings piece collecting the attitudes of famous smart people throughout history regarding boredom. And special bonus tweet of the week, Evgenia on Mars tweeted at me. So I feel like the coolest kid at the dance.